you. You may be seated. Calling civil case 092292, Christine Ferry et al. versus Arnold Schwarzenegger et al. Appearances, counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore B. Olson, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning. Honor. David Boies of Boies, Schiller, and Flexner on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore J. Boutrous, Jr., Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, also for the plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Christopher Dussel of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, also for the plaintiffs. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honor. Amir Tehrani from Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, also for the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Jeremy Goldman from Boies, Schiller, and Flexner on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Therese Stewart on behalf of the City and County of San Francisco. Good morning, Your Honor. City Attorney Dennis Herr on behalf of the City and County of San Francisco. Good morning. Any other appearances on the plaintiff's side? All right. Mr. Cooper. Good morning, Mr. Chief Judge. Charles Cooper with Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. David Thompson of Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. Howard Nielsen with Cooper and Kirk also for the defendant intervenors. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Nicole Moss for defendant intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. Peter Patterson also for the defendant intervenors. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Brian Rahm with the ADF for the defendant intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. James Campbell of the Alliance Defense Fund on behalf of the defendant intervenors. Well, we have some other defendants. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honor. Claude Colm, Deputy County Counsel for Defendant Alameda County Clerk Recorder. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chief Judge. Manuel Martinez also for County Clerk Recorder, Mr. Patrick O'Connell. Good morning, Your Honor. Michelle Enon on behalf of Attorney General Brown. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Manuel Medeiros also on behalf of Attorney General Brown. Good morning, Your Honor. Andrew Stroud, Minnemeyer, Glassman, and Stroud on behalf of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mark B. Horton, and Lynette Scott, defendants. Thank you. Good morning. Any other appearances? Well, this is an impressive array of legal talent. <laughs> All this legal talent that seems to be focused on one person at the moment. Um, welcome back. I'm delighted to have you back. Obviously, the hiatus that we've had, the period of time from the presentation of the evidence to the present, is not any thing that I would have wished or uh, hoped for. I was hoping that we could uh, get this case in before present. But it may be appropriate that the case is coming to closing argument now. June is, after all, the month for weddings. <laughs> so you have received the schedule, and we've allotted the day for your presentations. And I would simply propose that we get right to business. Mr. Olson, are you leading off for the plaintiffs? I am, Your Honor. Mr. Butcher says one housekeeping matter that uh, we'd like to bring to your attention before I start. All right, that's fine. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honor. With the court's permission today during closings, Mr. Olson will be playing some of the video clips from the trial proceedings. We propose, if this works for the court, that at the end of the day we would offer the transcript pages for the record uh, whenever it's convenient for the court rather than doing it during the closings, and then, then we'll have that for the record. That would seem to make sense. Uh, does it not, Mr. Cooper? Sorry, Your Honor, I'm not sure I followed the, the proposal to, to do. Maybe you can clarify. I can clarify. We will be playing video clips from the trial proceedings during the closing arguments. At the end of the day or whenever it is convenient for the court, we would offer into the record the transcript pages 
of the clips that we have played in court marked as exhibits for the record. I understand, and I see no objection to that, Your Honor. That'll be fine. Thank you. Well, any other housekeeping? Good. Mr. Olson. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Theodore B. Olson, on behalf of the plaintiffs, may it please the court. We conclude this trial, Your Honor, where we began. This case is about marriage and equality. The fundamental constitutional right to marry has been taken away from the plaintiffs and tens of thousands of similarly situated Californians. Their state has rewritten its constitution in order to place them into a special disfavored category where their most intimate personal relationships are not valid, not recognized, and second rate. Their state has stigmatized them as unworthy of marriage, different, and less respected. Because marriage is at the heart and soul of this case, I want immediately to turn to the subject of marriage and what we have learned during this trial about what it means to be able to marry and then to have the right extinguished. I will focus on marriage from four perspectives, as seen by the proponents of Proposition 8, the Supreme Court of the United States, the plaintiffs, and the experts who came forward to share their knowledge and experience on the subject of marriage and those subjects during this trial. First, the proponents. In the words of their lead counsel, the central and defining purpose of the institution of marriage, what it has always been, is to promote procreation and to channel narrowly procreative act sexual activity between men and women into stable, enduring unions. He went on to say the core need that marriage aims to meet is the child's need to be emotionally, morally, practically, and legally affiliated with the woman and man whose sexual union brought the child into the world. It is quite clear from these statements and other statements made by the proponents during the trial, Your Honor, that the proponents of marriage and the proponents of, I mean, the proponents of Proposition 8 see marriage as an institution of, by, and for the state and to promote procreation and the raising of children by their biological parents, an institution to promote the state's interest. And proponents' counsel added in response to your question, Your Honor, that racial restrictions were never a definitional feature of the institution of marriage. At times during the trial, the proponents predicted grave consequences if same-sex marriage were to be legalized in California. For example, you asked, how does permitting same-sex couples to marry in any way diminish the procreative aspect or function of marriage or denigrate the institution of marriage for heterosexuals? Lead counsel responded, Your Honor, because it will change the institution. If the institution is deinstitutionalizing, he said, Mr. Blankenhorn will testify that will likely lead to very real social harms such as lower marriage rates and high rates of divorce and non-marital cohabitation with more children raised outside the marriage and separated from at least one of their parents. It is revealing, it seems to me, that the deinstitutionalization ma message is quite different from the thrust of the prop proponents yes on eight election campaign. That, in the words they put into the hands of all California voters, focused heavily on protect our children from somehow learning that gay marriage is okay. Protect our children from learning that gay marriage is okay. Those are the words that the proponents put in the ballot, in the voter information guide that was given to every voter. That was not a very subtle theme that there is something wrong, sinister, or unusual about gays, that gays in their relationship are not okay and decidedly not suitable for children, but that children might think it was okay, 
if they learned about gays getting married, like normal people. For obvious reasons, the gays are not okay message was largely abandoned during the trial in favor of the procreation and deinstitutionalization themes. And after promising proof that people might stop marrying and cease procreating if Proposition 8 were overturned, the proponents switched course from that pl platform as well and affirmatively argued that they actually had no idea and certainly no evidence that any of their prognostications would come to pass if Proposition 8 were to be enacted. Their counsel asserted in his words, the reality is that you will hear nothing but predictions in this trial about what the long-term effects of adopting same-sex marriage will be on the institution of marriage. It is not possible, he said, to render reliable and certain judgments on these things. But it is the plaintiffs, after all, who bear the burden of proof, do they not, Mr. Olson? Yes, and I want to juxtapose the burden of proof with respect to, yes, we have a burden of proof up to a certain point, depending upon the standard of review. But I thought it was very important to juxtapose. And that standard of review being rational basis? No, we believe, we believe, as we uh, articulated during the course of the trial and memorandum that we submitted just yesterday, that strict scrutiny is required here because this is a discrimination, the taking away of a fundamental right as articulated by the Supreme Court. It's a putting the plaintiffs and others like them in a suspect classification based upon sex and sexual orientation. That Those two things under the Equal Protection Clause and Due Process Clauses justify strict scrutiny. Now, but are you focusing on the facts pertaining to the California Initiative or facts pertinent generally and throughout the country with respect to marriage? Both of those. And when I was, what I was going to do, if, with, your, with your Honor's indulgence, is juxtapose what the plaintiffs have said their position is about what marriage is all about and what Proposition 8 would do with these other four perspectives, the Supreme Court, the plaintiffs themselves, and the expert witnesses. But I wanted to complete that one point that the proponents have shifted from protect our children to procreation and deinstitutionalization. Does that make any difference? It, I, I think it does make a difference because I think it suggests that the vacuum that exists in connection with the attempt by the proponents to provide a basis for what Californians did in November uh, when it passed Proposition 8. Proponents well, count, excuse me. No, the um, Supreme Court's decision in the um, Cloverleaf, the Minnesota versus Cloverleaf case, and what the Supreme Court told us there, that was an equal protection case, of course, is that any debatable proposition will support the enactment. And while one challenging on equal protection grounds can certainly introduce evidence that the classification is irrational, if there is any debatable proposition in support of the classification, it passes muster. Well, it has to be a debatable proposition, not that there is a debate about a proposition. You ah, have, well, now what's that difference? Well, the difference is that, the, as, as, the, as the Supreme Court said in the Romer case, there has to be a rational objective that the government is seeking to sustain and that the measure itself will advance that rational proposition. Now, the Supreme Court looks at this issue in various different ways, depending upon whether we're talking about strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny, as it did in the VMI case, in the gender discrimination context, or in the rational basis case. But what the Supreme Court did say in the city of Cleveland case, uh, Cleburne case, that mere negative attitudes, fear, or unsubstantiated factors or assertions won't be sufficiently cognizable, and that's in a rational basis case involving retarded persons and housing. And the proponents' counsel said, it came down to this, same-sex marriage is simply too novel an experiment to allow for any firm conclusions about its long-term effect on societal interests. They just don't know. That is the 
essence of the case as it comes to the end of the trial and to the closing arguments. They just don't know whether same-sex marriage will harm the institution of heterosexual marriage. And I submit that the overwhelming evidence in this case proves that we do know. And the fact is that allowing persons to marry someone of the same sex will not in the slightest deter heterosexuals from marrying, from staying married, or from having babies. In fact, the evidence was from the experts that eliminating invidious restrictions on marriage strengthens the institution of marriage for both heterosexual and homosexual persons and their children. In the face of all of this evidence going in one direction, proponents' argument of last resort that the absence of evidence or logic as a justification uh, is a justification of their various positions. But it's nothing but a fig leaf for the fact that after a three-week trial and an opportunity to present any expert witness they wished, the very best case that the proponents could measure, arrange for us or to put forth for you is to argue that Proposition 8 is constitutional because California voters don't know whether allowing gays and lesbians to marry would discourage heterosexuals from procreative marriage, procreative conduct. Well, that is what the proponents say about marriage and the threat to their concept of the institution of marriage from allowing marriage by persons of the same sex. Well, they have identified a difference between opposite sex and same sex couples in that opposite sex couples can procreate without the intervention of some third party. That is a difference. And why is that difference not one that the legislature, or in this case the voters, could rationally take into account in setting the marriage laws in the state of California? As I said, they have to identify something that ties in with the subject matter of the legislation or constitutional provision that they're advancing. Yes, heterosexual people are able independently to procreate. Uh, homosexual people may have that same capacity, but in their relationships, that is not something that occurs. But we're talking about, because of that, taking array, away a right of an intimate relationship that the Supreme Court has called the right of privacy, the right of liberty, and you'd have to explain or make some statement that allowing these other individuals that we represent here today to engage in the institution of marriage will somehow stop that procreation or stop people from getting married or cause them to get divorced. That's one of the positions they took and then they said But doesn't they California don't know. accommodate uh, uh, gays and lesbians by providing domestic partnership rights which are essentially all of the rights associated with marriage? Why isn't that sufficient accommodation? Well, as the experts pointed out, and as the plaintiffs, and I'm going to in a moment or two with your permission, play some excerpts from the testimony of both the plaintiffs and the expert witnesses on that very subject, what marriage means versus something called domestic partnership, which means something completely different. But what I first wanted to do was recite briefly the second perspective on marriage. Now, we've heard the proponent's perspective on marriage, and you've alluded to that in your questions to me, I think it's really important to set forth the, the prism through which this case must be viewed by the judiciary, and that is the perspective on marriage, the same subject that we're talking about, by the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, the freedom to marry, the freedom to make the choice to marry, the Supreme Court has said in, I counted 14 cases, going back to 1888, 122 years, and these are the words of all of those Supreme Court decisions about what marriage is, and I've set forth this distinction between what the plaintiffs have called it and what the Supreme Court has called it. The Supreme Court has said that marriage is the most important relation in life. Now that's being withheld from the plaintiffs. It is the foundation of society. It is essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness. The right, it's a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights and older than our political parties. One of the liberties protected by the Due Process Clause, a right of intimacy to the degree of being sacred, and a liberty 
right equally available to a person in a homosexual relationship as to heterosexual persons. That's the Lawrence versus Texas case. Marriage, the Supreme Court has said again and again, is a component of liberty, privacy, association, spirituality, and autonomy. It is a right possessed by persons of different races, by persons in prison, and by individuals who are delinquent and paying child support. It is a right of individuals, not an indulgence dispensed by the state of California to favored, or any state, to favored classes of citizens, which could easily be withdrawn if the state were to change its mind about procreation. In other words, it is a right belonging to Californians, to persons. It is not a right belonging to the state of California. And the right to marry, to choose to marry, has never been conditioned on or tied to procreation. It hardly could be rooted in the state's interest in procreation, since the right to marry in Supreme Court cases has been invoked sustaining the right to contraceptives, to divorce, and just a few years ago, in that Lawrence case, to homosexuals. Well, if the right belongs to Californians individually, why cannot Californians collectively establish the parameters of that right? Well, they can, unless if they if they un, if the, unless they're taking away a fundamental right to marry under the Constitution, um, a, 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 with a compelling governmental interest and a proposition. Would this, case, no. would this case be different if the California Supreme Court in the marriage cases had invalidated the 18,000 or so marriages that were performed from, uh, I believe it was June or May 2008 until November? Yes. yes would, would this be. case be different? It would be different. It in would what be way? less worse. In what way? It's, it's, it's worse in this way. Right now, California has a... 18,000 same-sex marriages, if we can call it that for a moment, heterosexual persons who can marry the person in their choice. If they are a child molester, if they are a wife beater, if they are in prison for 15 murders, they can marry the person of their choice if they're heterosexual. Individuals such as the plaintiffs in this case and those who are similarly situated may not marry the person of their choice. We have a three strikes law in California. You can go to prison for life. But if you're homosexual, you can't get married. There's that category, the people that can get married, the people that can't get married. There's 18,000 people that were married during that period that you described and who are legally married. But if they get divorced or if they're widowed, they can't remarry. And they can't even remarry the same person in the case of a divorce because the Constitution wouldn't recognize well, it. But wouldn't the, wouldn't the marriage regime in California be more rational if, in fact, the California Supreme Court had invalidated those 18,000 marriages? It would be less irrational. That's, we're, I'm not, I don't think it would be rational at all because the distinction that's being made, and by the way, there's a fourth category, people that got married in other states when during a certain period of time or after a certain date, um, and who come to California, now they're living in California in a same-sex relationship, and their marriage is recognized. So there's four different categories. If you reduced it to three, yes, it would be less capricious and less arbitrary, but it wouldn't make it constitutional. And I why think not? It would not make it constitutional because there is not a compelling governmental interest to put the plaintiffs in a, uh, in a class like this and take away what the Supreme Court has called a fundamental right, a right of liberty, privacy, association, intimacy, and autonomy. You're taking away, the state is, that fundamental right. And even if we did, and, and, and if it was an intermediate scrutiny, you can't rely in the, the VMI case, for example, United States for versus Virginia, the Supreme Court said you can't make this up after the fact. One of the post hoc rationalizations won't work. One of the reasons why I explained to you the shift in position is to show you that the rationalizations that were being offered at the end of the trial were different than the motives that were in the ballot proposition and the advertising. These have become post hoc rationalizations because the proponents don't want to come in here and say, we passed, or the people passed Proposition 8 because they don't, they think gays 
are unusual. They don't want our children to know about them. That sounds awful lot like animus. So the rationalization now is procreation and something called the deinstitutionalization of marriage, whatever in the world that is. I think it's really important, given what the Supreme Court has said about marriage and what the proponents said about marriage, to hear what the plaintiffs have said about marriage and what it means to them in their own words. They have said that marriage means, and this means not a domestic partnership, this means marriage, the insti social institution of marriage that is so valuable that the Supreme Court says it's the most important relation in life. This, the plaintiffs have said that marriage means to them freedom, pride, these are their words, dignity, belonging, respect, equality, permanence, acceptance, security, honor, dedication, and a public commitment to the world, one of the plaintiffs said, it's the most important decision you make as an adult. Who could disagree with that? I, I would like, with your honor's permission, now to play a couple of excerpts from the testimony by the four plaintiffs, starting with plaintiffs Katami and Zerillo explaining why they want to marry, because they can say it better than I can. This is, first of all, Plaintiff Katami followed by Plaintiff Zerillo. Oh, and we, I guess we have to, what do we have to do? Okay, thank you. Why did you want to get married? There are many reasons. Um, I think the primary reason for me is because I found someone that I love and that I know I could de dedicate the rest of my life to. Um, and when you find someone who is not only your best friend but your best advocate and supporter in life, um, it's a natural next step for me to want to be married to that person. Now today, you're in a committed relationship uh, with another gay man, correct? Uh, tell me a little bit about that man. The love of my life. I love him probably more than I love myself. I would do anything for him. I would put his needs ahead of my own. I would be with him in sickness and in health, in rich or for poor, or death or part, just like Bows. I would, I would do anything for him, and I want nothing more than to marry him. Now, uh, plaintiff Kristen Perry. If the courts of the United States were ultimately decided that you and other same persons seeking to marry someone of the same sex could indeed, did indeed have the constitutional right to get married. Do you think that that would have an effect on other acts of discrimination against you? I believe for me personally as a lesbian that if I had grown up in a world where the most important decision I was going to make as an adult was treated the same way as everybody else's decision, that I would not have been treated the way I was growing up or as an adult. There's something so humiliating about everybody knowing that you want to make that decision and you don't get to, that, you know, it's hard to face the people at work and the, and the people even here right now, and, and it, many of you have this, but I don't, so. I have to still find a way to feel okay and not take every bit of discriminatory behavior toward me too personally because in the end that will only hurt me and my family. So if Prop 8 were undone and kids like me growing up in Bakersfield right now could, could never know what this felt like, that I assume that their entire lives would be on a higher arc. They would live with a higher sense of themselves that would improve the quality of their entire life. And plaintiff Sandra Steer. 
Tell, a, tell us what it means to you as a plaintiff in this case, if you were to be successful, how it would change your life? Well, I, I think it would change my life dramatically. Um, the first time somebody said to me, are you married? And I said, yes. I would think, oh, what? That feels good. It feels good and honest and true. Um, I would feel more secure. I would feel more accepted. I'd feel more pride. I'd feel less protective of my kids. I'd feel like, less like I had to protect my kids or worry about them or worry that they feel any shame or um, sense of not belonging. Uh, so I think they're immediate, very real, and very desirable personal gains that I would experience and, of course, close family. Um, but on a different level, you know, as a parent, you're always thinking about that other generation, that next generation, because you're, they're in your house. <laughs> so you're constantly thinking about the world that you're, the society you're in. What are you doing for them? And are we building a good world for them? And I really want that. I want uh, our kids to have a better life than we have right now. When they grow up, I want it to be better for them. And then their kids, I want their lives to be better too. So I really do think about that generation and the possibility of having grandchildren someday and, and having them live in a world where they grow up and whoever they fall in love with, it's okay. Because they can be honored and they can be true to themselves and they can be accepted by society and protected by their government. Um, and that's what I hope can be the outcome of this case in the long run. And as somebody who's from one of those conservative little pockets of the country where there isn't necessarily a lot of difference in the types of people that are there, having those legal protections is everything. It's important for these kids that don't have ready access to all types of people to le at least feel like the option um, to be true to yourself is an option that they can have too. And that's what I hope for. I hope for something for Chris and I, but we're big, strong women. You know, we're, um, we're in a good place in our lives right now. So we would benefit from it greatly, but other people over time I think would benefit it in such a more profound, life-changing way. We had the time, Your Honor. I could not present a more compelling closing argument than simply replaying the testimony in its entirety of the four plaintiffs and Helen Zia. They have described from their hearts what marriage means to them, what it does to them, and says about them to be denied that right. If we did nothing else in this trial, that would be enough. And the two plaintiffs, Perry and Steer, are in a domestic partnership relationship you'll recall during the trial. It isn't the same thing. But we have so much more. There were eight experts, persons who have studied and written about American history, marriage, psychology, sociology, economics, and political science throughout their entire professional lives. I have the time to discuss just a segment of what they had to say, but their evidence was remarkably powerful persuasive and very consistent. Professor Cott, for example, explained that contrary to proponents' assertion, marriage is not primarily a vehicle by which the state promotes procreation. She's an expert in marriage. She testified that its core social meaning, marriage, is a couple's choice to live with one another, to remain committed to one another, and to form a household based on feelings about one another and their agreement to join in an economic partnership and support one another in terms of the material needs of life. She said it is an aspect of liberty, a basic civil right, the ability to marry is an expression of one's freedom. Those are the same things coming from the expert on marriage that the Supreme Court has been saying for 122 years. And contrary to proponents' assertions, racial restrictions have indeed been a definitional feature of marriage. For example, as we learn from her, slaves were not permitted to marry until the Emancipation Proclamation. And she testified, and I'd like to play that excerpt, if we can do the same mechanical things, 
uh, to have her testify what it meant to the slaves. What happened when slaves were emancipated? When slaves were emancipated, they flocked to get married. And this was not trivial to them by any means. They saw the ability to marry legally to replace the informal unions in which they had formed families and had children, many of them, to replace those informal unions with legal valid marriage in which the states in which they lived would presumably protect their vows to each other. Uh, in fact, one quote that historians have drawn out from the record, uh, because many of these ex-slaves were illiterate, of course, but one quotation that is the title of an article a historian wrote is said by an ex-slave who had also been a Union soldier, and he declared, the marriage covenant, the foundation of all our rights, meaning that it was the most everyday exhibit of the fact that that he was a free person. He could say, I do, to his partner. What a powerful statement that slave made. The marriage covenant is the foundation of all of our rights. It exemplified freedom. He could